Amen. Amen. All right. It's great to be back here again this evening. Uh, Faith Ward Baptist Church, again, I appreciate all the hospitality and getting a chance to see everybody and uh, just stand behind the pulpit and preach out of the Bible for you. Um, I appreciate being here. And, um, you know, this is a lesson for those who only come on Sunday morning. If you only come on Sunday morning, you're just going to get the face-ripping sermon. You got to come to, to both services and then, you know, maybe back off a little bit and, and do some other type of teaching. Uh, so I don't plan. I think I kind of blew my throat out a little bit this morning. So I'm, I'm going to try to take it a little bit easier this evening. But I want to actually, I want to teach on something tonight. I want to teach on traditions uh, versus the Bible to kind of deal with uh, the, just a concept of keeping <clears throat> traditions. And I think that broadly speaking amongst Christians, there's a really negative connotation with tradition in general. Um, just because of a particular passage where Jesus taught against the Pharisees and their traditions. But I think we need to get just kind of a broad scope and, and a, just a good understanding on if it's good or bad or what we should even do with traditions and, and dealing with things that are traditional. And I think you're going to see that it, it all is just going to be a matter depending on, because traditions aren't bad uh, in general. Just, just generally speaking, traditions are not bad. In fact, I think there's good traditions that we could have. Uh, that can be very helpful and useful, and we ought to have traditions established to uh, continue doing good things moving forward and to pass things down and to maintain a good tradition. There's nothing wrong with that, but of course, traditions can get out of balance and um, end up becoming a problem. So that's what we're going to be looking at tonight. That's the subject matter for uh, what I'm going to call a Bible study this evening. We're in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. And I just want you just to, just to prove this point of traditions being a good thing. Um, look at chapter 2 real quick. There's one verse I want to look at in chapter 2 of 2 Thessalonians. Excuse me, the Bible says in verse number 15, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. So clearly, clearly in the New Testament, there's a teaching that says keep the traditions. Now, of course... We're, we don't believe in the, in, the, in the unholy Catholic Church, right? We don't believe and in, in put tradition on like the same standing as the Word of God or something. All of our belief and practice comes from the Word of God. This is where we get our authority is literally from the Word of God. And we're going to see the dangers too of, of just following tradition blindly, right? Because we need to have the Bible as our guiding source for everything that we do and how we worship, how we serve. But traditions are not all a bad thing. Clearly, like I said, verse 15, hey, stand fast. Hold the traditions you've been taught. You know, when, you, when you receive good traditions, keep doing it. And that's the whole point of a tradition is something you repeat and do regularly, right? And you know, an example of a tradition that you keep here, you might not even realize, is just the order of service and the things that you do within the service. So you open up, you'll have a word of prayer, you'll sing some songs, right? You sing a specific number of songs every single time. I know when I come here, the format is always the same. You have a tradition by which you conduct your church service. Specific number of songs, you read the entire chapter that's going to be uh, referenced during the sermon, and, and all of these things are traditions. Now, does the Bible say you must have four hymns that are sung every time you gather together? No. Does it say you must have anything particular about these traditions that you're holding? No, it doesn't. But does that make these traditions bad traditions? Of course not. They're good things, right? It's, it's good to have a pattern. It's good to have that stability. It's good to be able to, to look at what you're doing and say, now, first of all, is what you're doing scriptural? Absolutely. When you're, when you're singing in the congregation to the Lord and praising God, yeah, you, you could find a lot of scripture to back that up, right? Prayer preaching, all of that, right? Everything that, that is happening within a church service all has biblical support and needs to be there, but the exact order and how you do every little thing down to the detail, God doesn't give us all the details on that because that's not as important giving you every single specific detail. He allows us, gives you the grace and the freedom to come up with your own traditions on how you're going to establish a, a, a proper church meeting coming together and hearing from the word of God and praising his name. So um, there's a lot of freedom that way. But the tradition is going to help you to maintain standards and maintain good teaching and good doctrine throughout ages. So that's part of the purpose of having a tradition is 
when you keep things the same and you keep going back day after day, week after week, you know, church service after church service, the young kids are going to grow up learning this tradition. Other you know, future generations will be able to know and tell a difference and, and notice the difference between the old time religion and all this new stuff that's going on. Right? When you keep a tradition, for example, with the church service, like I'm referencing, and then you go to one of the fun centers that's got all the smoke and the lights and the rock music, you know, like all this stuff, you go like, oh, hold on a second. It's going to be really weird for you when it's going against tradition, right? So there's something that should just jump out at you and at least be able to say, hold on a second. Is this right? Should we be veering off so far from this? Now, what's going to tell us if it's right is this book right here. Tradition's not right just because it's the tradition. Tradition's right if it's following what this book says. But tradition is a good thing because it's a tool that can be in place to help you go, hold on a second, things are changing pretty rapidly here. I don't know if this is good. This isn't the way we've been doing things. I need to, to check this and, and make sure it's correct. So here, there's traditions that have been taught to the, church, to the Thessalonians that they're being instructed to keep. Look at chapter 3 where we started there, where we read the whole passage. Uh, down in verse number 6, the Bible reads, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which he received of us. So now he's talking about, hey, when you, when you see these people who are walking disorderly, avoid them, mark them, and don't fellowship with them, don't associate with them. And he says, who are these people? Well, they're the people that aren't following the tradition that we gave you. Well, what is that tradition? What is the tradition that he gave them? Verse 7 says, For yourselves know how ye ought to follow us, for we behave not ourselves disorderly among you. So now he's, he's comparing these people who are walking disorderly and saying, well, we didn't walk disorderly when we were among you. So what, what does disorderly mean? Is that, you know, what, what exactly is that? Well, keep reading. Verse number 8. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day that we might not be chargeable to any of you. Not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an ensample unto you to follow us. So he's saying, look, we had the ability when we came and ministered to you the word of God to receive of your carnal things, to receive food, to receive, you know, sustenance while they're preaching God's word. But he said, we didn't do that. We didn't use those things. Not because we didn't have the ability to or the power to, but we wanted to give you an example. We wanted to show you that, hey, look, we're going to come in. We're going to work day and night. We're going to provide for ourselves and we're going to minister the word of God to you. And we're going to show you how to work hard. And we're going to show you how to get things done. And we're going to show you how you ought to be behaving and how you ought to be living your life. Not a lazy bum, but someone who's working, working hard. And look, we're not going to take anything from you. We're going to work double time to make sure you get what you need. And we're the example of not being disorderly. And if you keep reading, it becomes even more apparent. Look at verse number 10. <clears throat> For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. Hey, amen. That's a powerful scripture. Look. If you're, if you're not willing to work, then what makes you think that you have the, the, the entitlement to eat? You don't. You at least have to be willing to work. And this is, this is biblical, this is Bible teaching right here. And he's saying, look, we commanded this. Like, you know, when we were there, this was the rule. This is, this is the way things were. For we hear, verse 11 that there are some which walk among you disorderly. So there's a disorder, right? Working not at all, but our busybodies. Now them that are such, we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. So we see here a tradition mingled with a command. Right? The command, hey, if anyone's not going to work, neither should he eat. And the command even more clearly there in verse 12 is we command and exhort by Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. The tradition is, hey, we're the example. 
Look at what we're doing. We're putting this command into effect. We're actually taking the word of God here where the command from the, the, under the authority of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is that with quietness you need to work and eat your own bread. We're putting that into practice for you. So here's what that looks like. You know what that looks like? I'm not going to take anything from anyone else. I'm going to work real hard and make sure that I supply my own needs. And that's exactly what they did. And it, like you said, we had the ability or the power. It would have been righteous. It would have been just fine for them to receive of the people. Because they're working still. They're laboring for the Lord. They're doing the Lord's work. But in order to prove the point, in order to establish their tradition, in order to be the example, in order to make sure they understood what does this really mean, they showed them and said, no, this is how you do it. I'm working. I'm working a full-time job. I'm doing what I do. And you know what? I can still serve the Lord and I can still do all the things that I need to do. And I'm going to take care of myself. And you need to work and take care of yourself. And then we could still serve the Lord. And no one can say, well, I don't have time. I don't have time to read my Bible. I don't have time to go soul winning. I don't have time. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. The disciples gave the example. We're commanded to follow the Lord and, and do all the things that the Bible tells us as believers that we ought to be doing in addition to providing for yourself and for your family. And yes, it is possible. It may not be at the comfort level you'd like to have, but it's totally possible. Turn, if you would, to Deuteronomy chapter 31. So I really just want to establish this point that obviously there's some really good traditions that we can hold. And I'm not going to go into every single possible type of tradition that you could ever have. But it has more to do with analyzing traditions. Right? This is kind of the purpose. This is where I want people thinking about is get the learning, get the principles from the word of God. Understand that, no, there's actually really good purpose to have tradition. There's a really good purpose. There's a really good place for it. But it has to be in its proper role and in its proper place. And we always need to be able to evaluate our traditions and make sure that we are still keeping in line with the word of God and not going out of bounds and not allowing traditions to kind of spiral out of control. Look at Deuteronomy 31. We actually see, I consider these to be, even though it is the law of God, I consider a lot of the things, a lot of the uh, Levitical priesthood stuff especially, it's tradition. They're establishing order of events and what they need to do with the sacrifices, with all the order of, of um, you know, the trespass offering, the sin offering, all these different things that they had to do in their service to the Lord. But it was always done the same way every single time. They had their feasts. They had everything established. But it was also then part of the culture. Right? It's, it's because it was national. It was part of, of their tradition. So as people are being brought up, they're learning all of these things and it's being passed down from generation to generation. And of course, we know that there's tons of truth in the Old Testament, greater spiritual truth that's built into the, the feasts, the sacrifices, and all of the, the service-oriented things that God has commanded them to do. So um, it's a way, it's a mechanism by which people can continue to understand and have that good learning and understanding from the, from the Bible, sometimes even without fully realizing it by having these traditions. And honestly, this is one of the reasons why I don't, um, I'm not against the tradition of observing Christmas, for example. You know, there's some people out there that want to fight against that and be like, no, it's pagan and the origins and the roots of this and everything. Look, I'm not for Santa Claus. I'm not for covetousness and all the things that can get mixed in with the celebration of Christmas, but just the celebration of Christmas itself and honoring a birthday of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ on his planet, I think, I think that is a good thing. And we ought to keep our tradition in line with what's biblical. So is it scriptural going to St. Nicholas and sitting on his lap and, you know, expecting him to come down your chimney? No, no, there's nothing that's, that's particularly good about that tradition, okay? And it's definitely not scriptural or biblical, 
right? You could argue about how harmful it is, but I'm, I'm, not, I'm not really for it. The covetousness, especially, right? People trying to tell you, oh, you have to buy all, spend all this money and giving gifts to people and everything. Like, it should not become about, uh, you know, some drudgery or some chore. Oh, I have to buy all these Christmas gifts. Like, no, you don't. No, you don't. And everyone needs to get right on that, too, in their heart when it comes to gift giving and stuff. You give people gifts because you love them. You want to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. Amen. That's the right, that's the right part for that. But aside from that, you know, don't get swept up in the Black Friday and Cyber Monday and all the other uh, covetous uh, designed motivations out there for people to make merchandise of you. That is not right. But, you know, we need to establish and evaluate the traditions. Now, I had to turn to Deuteronomy chapter 31. Even in God's law, there's traditions. Look at verse number 19. This one comes in the form of a song. Deuteronomy 31, 19. Now, therefore, write ye this song for you and teach it the children of Israel. Put it in their mouths that this song may be a witness for me against the children of Israel. For when I shall have brought them into the land, which I swear unto their fathers that floweth with milk and honey, and they shall have eaten and filled themselves in wax and fat, then will they turn unto other gods and serve them and provoke me and break my covenant. So God already knows what's going to happen. So in advance, he's saying, teach them this song. I want you to make sure that everybody knows this song. Teach it to your family. Teach it to your kids. Just keep this song to be a witness for generations to come. When things get really easy, when you've got this inheritance, and the children of Israel start to stray away from the Lord, I want them to remember and know this song. When they stop reading their Bibles, when they stop going to church, when they stop worshiping the Lord, they're going to still know this song. Why? Because he's establishing it as a tradition. Yes, it's part of the law, but he's establishing it in a way that it's going to carry forward so that people don't forget about it. Verse 21, And it shall come to pass when many evils and troubles are befallen them. So when all of a sudden they find themselves in a big mess because they've strayed away from the Lord, that this song shall testify against them as a witness. For it shall not be forgotten out of the mouths of their seed. For I know their imagination which they go about even now before I have brought them into the land, which I swear. He's like, I know this in advance, but I want this song to be a witness. I want them when they've forgotten everything else and they find themselves in a bad situation that they know, hey, we're being cursed because of God, because of his law. And this is going to be contained in this song. So when they actually start thinking about the words of the song that they have all known, they've all sung, they've all you know, heard it forever. Oh, this is what this means. Maybe it'll be a wake up call to getting back to teaching about the Lord. So it's a good tradition. It's a good way of, of keeping things within the culture. So there's plenty of good uses for that. I mean, good traditions, set up traditions in your household with your family, you know, soul winning traditions, celebration, you know, traditions, all kinds of good things can be set up, especially for care of future generations. Now, turn if you would to Colossians chapter two, because we're going to look at some Examples of bad traditions. And this is going to be where people might throw away the baby with the bathwater, so to speak, of saying, well, all traditions are just real bad, and here's why. No, they're not all bad. Clearly, some are good, but some are bad. And we need to keep this in check. So let's look at Colossians chapter 2. Verse number 6. The Bible reads, As ye have therefore received... Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. So the warning here is warning about other traditions, the traditions of men. Right? So as a believer, he's saying, look, we, want, we need to be rooted and built up in Christ. We are established through Christ. Our life, how we live, what we do needs to have that establishment, the foundation of Christ. We need to be rooted and built up in him. So beware of these other foundations, of these other things that are out there, these, these philosophies of man that are out there that might sound real interesting or real intriguing and kind of you go, oh, wow, this sounds pretty true, right? And you hear some things that might sound real good, but has nothing to do with the Bible or nothing to do with God or, or 
it's just kind of its own philosophy of man, beware, because that could spoil you. That could turn you away just from the truth that we know is in the word of God. You say, what are you talking about, Pastor Burzins? Well, here's what I'm talking about. Philosophy, vain deceit, tradition of men, rudiments of the world, and, and just my own personal experience with this type of a thing is getting really uh, wrapped up in politics and political think and political ideologies and just kind of going down this pathway of trying to figure out like, well, where is the truth in this? And, you know, there's going to be different schools of thought and reasoning that sound really good, but they're not based in scripture. And the stuff that sounds good the reason why it sounds good is because it's going to match and line up with what the Bible says. So this is where you're going to get that. But while you're invested and interested in these things that sound real good because they have these, these nuggets and similarities of truth in what they teach, don't get too wrapped up in it so that you get carried away from the source of the truth, from being rooted and grounded in Christ as opposed to whatever philosophy that you have. For me, it was getting really interested in politics, as I mentioned, but then like into libertarianism, and then you start looking at anarcho-capitalism and all these other words and things, you know, like ideas, and then well, you have the non-aggression principle, and you've got all these other axioms that they philosophize about and try to come up with their utopian society. And look, I'm not against all of that broad brush in general, right? There's some truth and there's some good things about liberty and freedom that are good for you. But at the same time, you know, when you follow their logic, you're going to find yourself pitted against the word of God. So, you know, the example is, and if you don't know about all this stuff, don't worry about it. But, you know, like the non-aggression principle, they're going to tell you, well, you can't have uh, the death penalty for capital crimes, for example. Well, hold, hold on a second. I don't care what your stupid philosophy says. You know, the Bible tells us what the law ought to be and what the punishment ought to be for specific crimes. So, so hold on a second. I'm not going to go along with that if you're telling me that your axiom and your principles are telling you that we can't have the death penalty. And especially against sodomy or something like that. Like, uh, no, sorry, that's, you lost me there. But unfortunately, sometimes Christians will get so wrapped up in these other philosophies, these other mindsets, they get just real interested in it. They like the, the news and the debates and, and all the political talk, and it just kind of motivates them and stirs them up, that they end up getting their minds in like this Fox News world instead of in the Bible world and become listening and getting wrapped up in the philosophies of man and these vain traditions as opposed to just maintaining a proper viewpoint on this stuff. So it could spoil you. Now, I'm not saying you can't get involved in politics or whatever. I, I don't care what you do on that front. Just make sure that you're not getting wrapped up in some other philosophies and when they contradict the Bible that you don't ditch the Bible. Right? Keep the word of God in its proper place, primacy, and authority with how you think about things and don't let any other man-made philosophies come in and spoil what the Bible says for you. And don't go trying to fit the Bible into some man-made philosophy. Right? And go, well, how is this going to work? Let's see. No. You make anything else fit this. Because this is the source of the truth. And turn if you would to Mark chapter 7. So we do have to beware about the traditions of men and, and the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. Those things that the Bible is warning us about. Philosophy, vain deceit. But there's another warning that Jesus gives regarding tradition in, in Mark chapter 7. It's also found in Matthew um, regarding elevating a tradition and giving it a higher standing than it deserves. Right? Even some traditions could be good traditions, but they still need to be recognized as just a tradition as opposed to, say, a commandment of God. We saw, so, you know, I, I was showing you how I believe we could look at some of the commandments of God, the song that he had people learn, that can be labeled as a tradition, but they're still the word of God, right? It's still, it's still found literally in the, in the law or in the word of God. But then there's other things showing people how to work. It has the backing of a command, but a tradition that just kind of shows you how to implement 
those commands, which still is a good tradition, but, but what could happen is the tradition of, for example, showing people how to work really hard can, can then morph into something different that says like, well, you know, if you're not working 12 hours every day, then you're sinning. You're not right with God, right? Because you're not working hard enough or something, you know, something to that effect of, you know, where, where you, start, you start twisting what the Bible actually says into something and some man-made rules that now it's not, that's not what the Bible says, right? Hey, a good principle could be biblically based and saying, you need to work really hard. And here's how I do that. And, and, and I'm going to do this by working this many hours, this many days a week or whatever. Hey, that's fine. It could be helpful for people, but don't turn that into now this is a commandment and, and, and making bad applications of scripture into commands that don't exist. And this is what we see Jesus teaching about. Look at uh, Mark 7, verse number one. <clears throat> the Bible reads, Then came together unto him the Pharisees and certain of the scribes, which came from Jerusalem. And when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, that is to say, with unwashing hands, they found fault. And I think this is probably going to be, kids that read the Bible, one of their favorite passages Because we're talking about washing your hands before you eat, right? Are there any kids here? Mom and dad tells you, did you wash your hands? Because I, I say that, okay, I say that to my kids, right? Now, is washing your hands before you eat a bad thing? No, it's not. But we're going to see how this is abused and it was turned into something that it's not by the Pharisees, okay? So they had this rule where, um, you know, first they see the disciples eating bread and they didn't wash their hands. So the disciples are out with Jesus, they're working, they're toiling, and they go and make a sandwich, whatever, they get some bread, and they're like, whoa, 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 hold on a second, they didn't wash their hands. And first of all, that's a big red flag. I mean, how many adults are you going to go to, like you're at work and be like, hey man, did you wash your hands? <laughs> like you're eating your own food. <laughs> like, why, why are you getting in my business? Why do you care if I washed my hands? But this is what's happening. These are adults, right? The Pharisees are going, your disciples aren't washing their hands. They're finding fault. Verse 3, for the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands oft, eat not, holding the tradition of the elders. So the elders had this tradition that says you need to wash your hands before you eat. Okay, that's fine. Verse 4, and when they come from the market, except they wash, they eat not. And again, is this, is this particularly a bad practice? No. You go out in public, you go to the market, you go shopping, right? And you come back, well, I'm going to wait till I eat until I wash my hands. Fine. But we're, so what is the problem? Let's keep reading. And many other things there be which they have received to hold as the washing of cups and pots, brazen vessels and of tables. Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, why walk not thy disciples according to, to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? I mean, they're really upset about this. I mean, they're going to Jesus. Hey, how come your disciples aren't washing their hands first, huh, Jesus? What's up with that? He answered and said unto them, well hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites. And, that, you know, this is the big problem with them, by the way, is the hypocrites. As it is written, this people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Howbeit in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. This is where the tradition goes out of bounds. This is when it becomes an error. When you start saying, hey, your tradition of washing your hands now, they started to teach that as a commandment of God. Like, hey, you're not right. with, And that's why they're going to Jesus. And that's why they're finding so much fault with them, thinking that they're in this great sin because they didn't wash their hands. Like, oh, hold on a second. Chapter and verse, please, where the Bible says that if you don't wash your hands, you're in sin. You're not going to find it. But that's what they taught. But it was the commandment of men. And, you know, this should also give us a little bit of pause in general 
of making too broad of an application that would cause someone to think they're in sin because of, because of something you find somewhere in Scripture and then taking it to an illogical end, right? Because here's what I could think about this. I could say, well, hey, if I were thinking about trying to make this a commandment of God, you know, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, so we need to obviously care for and, and do what we can to make sure we're protecting our body. So if you're not washing your hands, then you're putting yourself at more risk to receive some kind of germ or infection or something that's going to harm you, which then is kind of destroying the temple of the Holy Ghost. See, so you're in sin if you don't wash your hands before you eat. Do you see, do you see how that works? And look, people do this. And you've got to be careful about it. You have to watch out for that. Now, Everything about that is okay until you start saying, well, now you're in sin and now you're, you know, this is a commandment of God. It's a teaching. It's a tradition of man. And that's all it is. And you know what about the traditions? Hey, to each their own. You don't like my tradition? You don't have to follow my tradition. The commandments of God, you have to keep those. My tradition, your tradition, you could do things different. It's just there as a guide, as a help. But they taught them as doctrines, but they were just the commandments of men. Verse 8, for laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups and many other such like things ye do. But it's not even just that with them. It gets worse for the Pharisees. Verse 9 says, and he said unto them, full well ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition. So, not only are they elevating some traditions to be like equal with the word of God or equal as a commandment of God, they've actually gone so far as to, as to elevate their tradition and then remove or lower God's commandment to not, you know, to where their command has the precedence over God's command. And he gives them an example here of how they do that. Verse 10, for Moses said, honor thy father and thy mother and whoso curseth father or mother, let him die the death. And look, that's a pretty straightforward commandment out of the word of God. It's one of the Ten Commandments, right? Honor your father and your mother. And whoso curseth father or mother, let him die the death. And hey, you know, there's a, there's a generation the Bible talks about. There's a generation. There's a generation that's coming where the children don't respect their parents at all. And we're seeing that manifesting, and it needs to be stopped. You know, there needs to be more respect for elders and for, especially for parents, when the kids just talking back and mouthing off and all this other stuff. And hey, kids will mouth off. Kids will talk back from time to time. They need to be disciplined. They need to be chastened. But when the Bible says, whoso curseth father or mother, let him die the death in the Bible, that's more than just a back talk. That's more than just getting out of line. You know, a curse is a serious thing. A curse is the exact opposite of a blessing. When you, start, when you start wishing evil against your own parents, right, that's a big deal. And now look, the honoring combined with this cursing of your father and mother is going to be applied more towards grown people. Like that's what it's for, is for grown-ups, people who are either you know, late teens or just adulthood where you're not honoring, you're not doing your duty as a child for your parent or you're just even worse, just wishing their death or wishing horrible things on them and cursing them. And according to the Bible, you deserve to be put to death for that. And yeah, does our society have gone really soft on that? Absolutely. But again, what does the Bible say? This is what we need to uh, form our minds around and get rooted in, even if it's completely contrary to what the world thinks. Verse 11, but ye say, if a man shall say to his father or mother, it is korban, that is to say, a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, he shall be free. And ye suffer him no more to do aught for his father or his mother, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition which ye have delivered. And many such like things do ye. So what they did is they made up their own tradition that just says, okay, when it comes to your father or your mother, you just got to tell them, put them in their place. 
hey, you just consider it a gift, however you might be profited by me. But that's not what the commandment of God said. See, they were allowing this to take place to where, oh, you just tell them that what I do, you just better appreciate what I do for you and just consider that a gift. As a, and look, a gift as opposed to a duty, two different things. Taken care of, and, and that word honor, just in case if anyone doesn't know uh, the biblical context and word, that word honor is a lot more than just respect. Of course it includes respect, but when the Bible says honor your father and mother, it's not just saying yes sir, no sir, yes ma'am, no ma'am. It's actually talking about caring for them, especially as they get into their older years, and supporting them and supplying their need and being there to do what, you know, to, to take care of them as they took care of you when you were an infant, when you were a baby, when you were a child. That's the honoring that they need, which is why he says, he references here, um, if, if you say it's a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, however you're going to increase, that they're, that they're disobeying the command to honor your father and mother. Because they're not doing, there's, there's action involved there in the honoring. It's a caring for. Just like when the Bible says in, 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 um, in Titus, no, in 1 first, in first Timothy chapter 5, for the, uh, the, you know, the elders that, that rule well are worthy of double honor. It's not a double thanks. It's a double caring of, caring for, right? That's the honor. It's, it's, it's being uh, provided for. So, it's the same thing here with honoring your father and your mother. It has to do with caring for them. But what did they do? They created their own tradition that's completely circumvented what the Bible said of saying, hey, it's your duty to care for your parents. And if you don't do it, you know, you're worthy of death or you're going to curse your parents. You're worthy of death. And they just disregard all of that and just say, yeah, you know what? Whatever you do for them, they could just, just count their lucky stars and be thankful that you did anything for them. It's wicked. All right, shifting gears, let's turn to uh, 1 Kings chapter 3. So we can see some of the dangers there when traditions get out of control and they start going against what the Word, what the word of God says. You've got a huge, a huge problem. And this is why, you know, the, all the traditions of the Catholic Church we don't observe, you know, the baptizing of babies, the confessing to a, a man in a booth, the, you know, all, all of the, very, the, the eating of, of the wafer that they believe is becoming, you know, flesh in your mouth. All these weird traditions, we, we don't observe that because all of them are against scripture. All of them are. So we don't, we, don't, we don't consider that to be, oh, well, it's really traditional because people have been doing this for a long time. Well, I don't care how long they've been doing it. People have been sinning for a long time. People have, have gotten the word of God wrong for a long time too, but we're not just going to keep on doing it just because it's old or just because it's been done a certain way for a long time. Traditions have their place, but it needs to be balanced. What, a, a great example of this we see of something that lasted for a really long time amongst God's people has to do with the high places and the groves. It's in God's law he commanded where and how they were going to worship him and build their altars, and, and it was not to be in the high places or the groves specifically, but what happened? They built high places and groves. And that lasted just throughout, like almost all of the nation of Israel's existence through all of the kings and, you know, like almost all the way to the end. How many times, and we're going to see this, uh, I actually have a few references for you where kings are righteous, are doing the right thing, but they didn't, they didn't get rid of the high places, yeah. right? And, that, and I'll tell you, one of the reasons for that is why is because it was a tradition, because that's the way things have been done. And no one challenged that. No, no one was saying, hey, should we be doing this? And we need to always be ready to challenge the things that we do, especially when it comes to our service to God, but even just in general, like, like what are we doing? Why do we actually do this? 
We need to learn and understand and know why you do the things that you do. Well, it's just always the way it's been done. Well, why? Why? And that's one of the things that, that I loved even coming here for the first time way back when is that there were some traditions that were held amongst IFB churches that needed to be updated. For example, the, the singing the first and last verse of a hymn, <laughs> right? Hey, that's a tradition that's held still to this day in many, 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 many churches. And why? Now look, is that the worst thing in the world anyone could ever do? No, but it's like, but why is that the case? Why are you keep shortening up the amount of time that you're singing by? Like, why is that now the tradition? You know, I think there's a reason why there's four verses, five verses in these songs, because there's a lot to teach. There's a lot to exhort one another with through the song. So singing all the verses of the song. How about more than just one Bible verse in a church service? Well, here's the one Bible verse, and now I'm going to talk for an hour or 30 minutes or 20 minutes or whatever and say, there you go. But hey, that's not the best tradition. Why don't we read like the whole context of what we're going to be looking at and then get even more context throughout the sermon, throughout the preaching. Right? These are all things that you need to be able to. And I'm thankful because Pastor Anderson led the way with that. Now, is he unique and he's the only person that ever sa sings all the songs and you know, all the verses in a songbook or reads a whole chapter? Like, of course not. Of course not. There's plenty of other people that have done that throughout history and still do that today. But it's just been this tradition that's been happening and we need to, to stop and go like, well, wait, why are we even doing this this way? Let's not do it that way. And you have to be able to, you know, it's easy to go along. It's easy to continue going down the same path. It's comfortable. When you start changing things up a little bit, that gets uncomfortable. Which is why, in many cases, the right tradition can be good. Because you want to keep people comfortable in a good tradition. But don't allow it to get elevated to the point of, now your tradition is more like a commandment. 1 Kings chapter 3, verse number 1, the Bible says, And Solomon made affinity with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and took Pharaoh's daughter, and brought her into the city of David, until he had made an end of building his own house, and the house of the Lord, and the wall of Jerusalem round about. Only the people sacrificed in high places, because there was no house built unto the name of the Lord until those days. And Solomon loved the Lord, Walking in the statutes of David, his father, only he sacrificed and burnt incense in high places. So the Bible is clearly, you know, it's talking about, hey, Solomon loved God. Solomon loved the Lord. He had the right heart. He had the right attitude. He asked for wisdom. But even in this passage right here in his verse three, but there is this other thing. Okay, but he still sacrificed and burnt incense in high places. And he even gives some reasoning for that. It says, well, people, the people burned and sacrificed in high places. Why? Because there wasn't a house built. But where in the Bible did it say there had to be a house built? Nowhere. David's the one that wanted to build a house. It was just in his heart and said, hey, you know, like, we have nice houses. You've established us. This is really great. I think we should honor you, Lord, and build a nice house for you to, to have like a temple here, right? This, is, this was, it was a good thing out of his heart, but God, that's not how he made it. He already gave them laws and rules and establishment on the ark and the tabernacle and how things ought to be done and how they ought to worship. So the people need, didn't have a house still does not justify, this is just, but the Bible doesn't know what was in their mind, like, oh, well, there's not a house, so we're just gonna go to these high places. Eh. Well, but that's what people just did and then continued to do. Because if that were the case, then when Solomon built the temple, why didn't they just stop with all the high places? Oh, yeah, they didn't. They continued to do the groves in the high places. You don't have to turn to these places. Turn, if you would, to, um, to Nehemiah chapter 8. This should be the last place that, that I have you turn to. I'm just going to read a few other passages out of the Kings for you. 1 Kings 14, verse 22. You're going to Nehemiah 8. The Bible says, And Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they provoked him to jealousy with their sins, which they had committed above all that their fathers had done. For they also built them high places and images and groves on every high hill and under every green 
tree. And that's just kind of proving, you know, God's not happy with this. They, they provoked God to jealousy and made him angry by doing these things, by building the high places, by making these images and making the groves. God didn't like that. And even well-meaning, righteous people, righteous kings can fall into the trap of not doing what's right all the time or not fully following everything that God said or, or even participating in things that God said not to do, right? So some of those references, 2 Kings 12, 3 says, but the high places are not taken away. The people still sacrifice and burn incense in the high places. 2 Kings 14, 4, howbeit the high places were not taken away. As yet the people did sacrifice and burnt incense on the high places. 2 Kings 15, 4, save that the high places were not removed. The people sacrificed and burnt incense still on the high places. In 2 Kings 15, 35, how be it the high places were not removed. The people sacrificed and burnt incense still in the high places. He built the higher gate of the house of the Lord. So in all these, these references, the context is, hey, this guy was really good and he did this and this and this and this and here's how he served the Lord and this is some good stuff he did. But yeah, you know what? But they still offer it in the high places. 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 So over and over, and look, this can go on for hundreds of years. A tradition that could be long standing and long held. And the longer it goes, people are going to be less likely to challenge it. Because, hey, man, this is just the way it's been done. But you still have to challenge it. Like the Catholics will try to tell you, well, this is the way things have been done since, you know, the apostles. Like, first of all, yeah, right. That's not true. But second of all, I don't care how far back your religion goes. And what you think your traditions, you know, the religion of the Pharisees is still around today. That doesn't make it right. They have all kinds of tradition that they follow because they never received the correction from Jesus and continued with that religion. That's the religion of Judaism. As we know it today, it's the religion of the Pharisees. That's the history. So we always need to be ready to correct the errors of the past, the errors of tradition with the word of God. And this is how we're going to keep things balanced and right on. Nehemiah chapter 8. There's a great example of this. Now, just a context, Nehemiah, the book of Nehemiah, Ezra, Nehemiah, this is about the children of Israel coming back into the land after their captivity by the Babylonian Empire, okay? So, just for the context, Moses leads the children of Israel out of Egypt. Joshua brings them into the promised land, right? Moses gives them the law. They, they've got the time where judges are ruling the people until they establish a king. So Samuel being the last judge, you've got King Saul, King David, with, you know, you got the split uh, 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 after King Solomon, King Rehoboam. You've got the split of the kingdom, northern kingdom, southern kingdom. And you've got all of 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles. You've got all that history, right? Hundreds and hundreds, like, all these years going by. From the time of Moses, from the time of Joshua. And then through the 70 years captivity. And now... They're coming back into the land and the events of Nehemiah are taking place. Just keep that in mind as we keep reading here in chapter 8. Verse number 8. So they read in the book, in the law of God, distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. And you know what? That was a good thing. And that's a tradition that we're trying to hold to today. We read in the book, in the law, distinctly, right? Here's what it says and give the sense of it, give the meanings. Hey, this is what it means when we read this and this is what it says and cause people to understand what this is talking about. This is what we do in church. And Nehemiah, which is the Tershatha and Ezra, the priest, the scribe and the Levites that taught the people said unto all the people, this day is holy unto the Lord, your God. Mourn not, nor weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. I mean, it's a lot to take in, right? So they're hearing the Bible being read and being explained, expounded upon, and they're weeping. They had done a lot wrong, right? 
I mean, think about their history. Think about where they're coming from. And it's like, wow, that's a lot to take in for people who are not being taught properly. People are not receiving the word of God. A whole people, a whole nation who had turned their hearts away from the Lord. Now they're, they're there. They're ready to start again. They're getting their hearts right. They're hearing the word of God. And it's just causing them to weep. But the leaders, the Levites, you know, they're, they're telling them, wait, don't weep. Like, this is, this is a good thing. Because we got the word of God. We're going to give you the word of God. We're teaching the word of God. We're going to follow the word of God. This is good. Right? So we're, gonna, we're resetting where we're at. And we're going to check our, our traditions, the things that were done in the past. And we need to do things the way they were done that the Bible says so that the, the word of God says they need to be done. So that's a good thing to make that reset. Verse 10, then he said unto them, go your way, eat the fat and drink the sweet and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto our Lord. Neither be ye sorry for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Hey, be happy hearing the word of God. Yeah, sometimes it stings. Sometimes it's not nice and always pleasant to know and to hear about your errors, but be happy that God's telling us what our errors are, right? That he's given us instruction. He's given us word. That's a good thing. It's a positive thing. So let's just put it into place and we're going to be way better off and now God's going to establish us. So this is good. Let's, let's rejoice in that. So the Levites stilled all the people saying, hold your peace for the day is holy. Neither be ye grieved. Verse 12. And all the people went their way to eat and to drink and to send portions and to make great mirth because they had understood the words that were declared unto them. And on the second day were gathered together the chief of the fathers of all the people, the priests and the Levites, unto Ezra the scribe, even to understand the words of the law. And they found written in the law, which the Lord had commanded by Moses, look at this, that the children of Israel should dwell in booths in the feast of the seventh month. So now they're reading this part of the law. They're reading this part where they say, huh, you know, it says here, because they're looking at it distinctly and they're looking at the word of God and they're going, you know, this says that we need to dwell in booths during the feast of the seventh month and that they should publish and proclaim in all their cities and in Jerusalem saying, go forth unto the mount and fetch olive branches and pine branches and myrtle branches and palm branches and branches of thick trees to make booths as it is written. So we need to make some tents. We need to make some, you know, some structures here. We need to build these booths because this is what was commanded in the word of God. Look at verse 16. So the people went forth and brought them and made themselves booths, everyone upon the roof of his house and in their courts and in the courts of the house of God and in the street of the water gate and in the street of the gate of Ephraim and all the congregation of them that were come again out of the captivity made booths and sat under the booths. For since the days of Joshua, the son of Nun, unto that day had not the children of Israel done so, and there was very great gladness. Talk about a long-standing tradition of not holding the word of God. I mean, Moses received the commandment, Joshua kept it, and it died with Joshua. I mean, I don't know if it got too uncomfortable or whatever, when people stopped doing that, now, now think about this because this is, I mean, it's kind of mind-blowing to think you can have an unchanged word of God that would be maybe not as accessible to your average everyday person as it is today. Hey, thank God for that. But it was still accessible. It was still around. They still had the word of God amongst them. And especially through all those years, all those centuries of time, and no one in authority that was establishing these feasts and you know no one made the correction that's the power of tradition right so we can have good traditions that can be very powerful and very long lasting and, and can last for for millennia and that would be a good thing for good traditions but we have to always be willing to challenge the tradition, and even if it makes you a little uncomfortable, it's a challenge to be like, wait, is this right? Should we be changing something about it? Are we doing everything right? Because that's what matters. Hey, let's make sure we're right in the eyes of the Lord. 
right? Isn't that what we care about? We care about the truth. And if we're doing something wrong, Lord, please show us, open up our eyes to the scripture, any part of our service, any part of our Christian life, any of our traditions, any of the ways that we observe, what you would have us to do, Lord, open up our eyes, give us understanding and help us to see so that we don't just continue in error that might've been started from previous generations. Because we care about your word and we want to do it right. But in order to even be ready for that, you need to be in this. You need to be in this. You need to be reading this daily. You need to be studying. You need to be understanding. You need to be getting it regularly. Because, you know, at the end of the day, we are all responsible for our own walk with the Lord. So whatever traditions you keep, measure them against this book. No one alive has all knowledge, right, and understands all things and all mysteries. And, you know, we strive to, we want to understand it all. We know we can't. So we're going to be in error, but we don't want to get too stiff-necked and cling too tight tradition. But we do want to establish good tradition so that they can continue forward. Let's establish really good traditions on all the things that we could see in scripture that are good and right. And I recommend in your family, start family traditions. Hey, the Burzens family, here's what we do. You're a Burzens, you're gonna do this. Your family, this is what we're gonna do in my house. This is how we're gonna, you know, whatever, establish family traditions, you know, uh, um, Christmas traditions or what, whatever, however you wanna set it up but something that's going to be you know, mindful of serving God, some way of, of making sure that this is going to continue to move forward. Something just popped into my mind. There's something that, that we had, and I think this is, this is somewhat common. I used to think it was kind of silly, and I didn't know anything about it, but this proves my point of why some traditions could be very good traditions. On Easter, when I was a kid, and we would get together at family, family event, family come, get together for Easter time, right? It was a big deal. We would always go, everyone would get together at Easter time and have like a brunch after church. And they always served a lamb cake. I'm not saying you have to do this, but when I was a kid, I was just like, Haha, what a, what's this lamb about? You know, whatever. I didn't know anything about it. Like I was pretty dumb. I was ignorant on it. But it was a tradition. But now I kind of understand the reason why there was a lamb cake being served, right? Because they're honoring the lamb, the lamb of God, right? Slain from the foundation of the world is there for you, our savior, of course. But this is why you can, you can set up and establish these traditions that it doesn't, you know, the Bible doesn't say you have to make a lamb cake anywhere. But is it, is it a bad thing to have? I would say no. I think it's a good thing. Those are little things like that that you could maybe just carry forward and just do and say, hey, every year we're going to do this. Every so often, this is what we do. And the whole goal is to make sure that future generations are going to know the truth, are going to be pointed to the word of God, are going to receive a testimony like the song that Moses was taught to teach all the children of Israel. Hey, this points us to God. This points us to the truth. This is something that people might one day just ask and be like, well, why do we do that? Why do we have uh, brides in wearing all white? Why, why is it that the, the minister says you may now kiss the bride? Why do we have these traditions? Why is that it? Why is it like that? You know what? There's a good answer for that stuff. There's a really good answer. The purity of the bride. Nowadays, it's just kind of like, well, we just wear white. You got all these whores and whoremongers going around. It's like, well, I'm just going to wear white because I want to wear like a. You, you, you don't even know what that's about at all. Not all traditions are bad. We need to establish good traditions, but also to always be willing to, to challenge traditions and make sure they line up with the Bible. Let's bow our heads up a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the good traditions that have been established in our lives, even up to this point. And we pray that you would please help us to, just in all that we do, Lord, that you'd guide us and, and help us to see the error of our own ways or our own traditions or things that we have maybe propped up in our lives that aren't necessarily accurate, but that you would help us to be able to teach and train up the future generations and make sure that the truth will continue and that we can um, design 
good traditions that can move forward and, and, and help people in their understanding and not lose sight of, of their service to you, Lord. Uh, we love you. We thank you for this opportunity to come together. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.